Welcome to Story Collider. Yeah! <laughs> awesome. Isn't this awesome? Yes. So I'm a Canadian, and my dad was a science teacher. So I grew up pretty much with the idea that the grass is green, the sky is blue, and climate is changing due to human activities. <laughs> and then I moved to the States for grad school. I was unaware that there were people in the world who thought that basic radiative transfer and nonlinear fluid dynamics was a myth. <laughs> I was also unaware that there were people in the world who did not drink. <laughs> I was so unaware of these two facts that I married someone before I knew that he was both. <laughs> you may ask, what do you talk about in graduate school? And the answer is you talk about a lot of things, but when you don't ever imagine that the other person you're talking to doesn't think climate change is real, why would it come up? And on his part, he had never met somebody who shared his faith who did think climate change is real. He grew up in Northern Virginia in the horse farm country. My husband is a really smart person. He was doing his PhD in applied linguistics when I met him. He was an endowed professor at the University of Notre Dame at age 27. He'd be in the gym playing basketball with the students, and they'd be like, well, what do you study? And he'd be like, I teach you. <laughs> but we had been married a couple of months before it dawned on us that we were on opposite sides of the fence when it came to a change in climate. So here we were married to each other. We loved each other. We would prefer to stay married to each other. And, and this is most important, we respected each other. I knew he was a very smart person. He did quantitative research. He understood data and statistics. And he knew that I wasn't one of those people that he'd always imagined, you know, fudging the data for monetary gain that I sincerely was doing what I was doing, not for the monetary gain, but because I was genuinely concerned and I wanted to make a difference in the world. So we started talking. We started doing the most uncomfortable thing in the world, which is talking to someone you love about something that you profoundly disagree with them on. And it wasn't a conversation that happened every day. But, you know, once a week, twice a week, take a break for a couple of weeks, we waded through the questions he had, the objections he had. And I'm gonna tell you something, I feel like I learned more from him than he learned from me. Because I had never spent any time talking to people who didn't think that climate change is real. I just imagined they were sort of over there, way distant, some di other type of species. But here was someone who I knew, who was smart, who was curious, and he didn't think it was real, so we could talk about it, and I could kind of start to understand, well, what have you heard? What have you been told? What are your objections? And he never had a chance to look at the data either. So it wasn't a, a light bulb turning on one day. It was a slow, gradual process with inflection points. One of the inflection points was when we went to NASA's website, and we downloaded the global temperature data. And he himself opened it up in Excel and fit a trend line to it. And he said at that point, he had a choice. Is all of NASA who put men on the moon involved in a global hoax extending back decades, even centuries, or is the planet actually warming? And then you have to get into, well, how do we know that it's humans? Could it be the sun? We dug up the, temp the, the radiation data for the sun and we looked at what the sun's been doing. Turns out its energy's been going down the last 40 years, not up. What about orbital cycles? We got into that too. According to orbital cycles, we should be heading into the next ice age, not getting warmer. We dug into El Nino and looked at how El Nino can't just spontaneously create heat. It can lose a little bit of heat out the top of the atmosphere, but all it does is rearrange the energy balance of the Earth's climate system. And then the rubber really hit the road. The root of his objections were not scientific. The root was ideological. How can we fix this thing without destroying the economy? 
Doesn't it mean that we need more government regulations so the government's going to start telling us how much water we can use when we shower and what type of car we can or can't not drive? And that was where we've had the most fruitful conversations. We still have those conversations today. But today, the other day, I heard him texting his friend. And he was lecturing his friend about climate change. <laughs> He said, don't you know that the poorest and most vulnerable people in the world are the very ones most affected by a changing climate? And in addition to being a linguist, my husband is a pastor and his friend was a pastor. So he's saying, as Christians, we have to care about the poorest and those who are suffering in the world today. And that's why we should care about climate change. What type of political ideology have you swallowed that makes you blind your eyes to these facts? I have to say my favorite thing in the world is when somebody goes for me, and if you know me, you know people go for me every day on social media, on Facebook, sometimes an email, I even get some written letters. Occasionally I walk down the hall to my office and I see somebody kind of walking around with this look in their eye and I'm like, oop, I think I have to go the other way. But my favorite thing is when somebody goes for me in front of my husband because I just sit back and he just digs right in. <laughs> But I honestly believe that I learned so much more from him than he learned from me. Because he showed me how to put yourself in someone else's shoes. How to understand that people already have values and that in fact just about every single person on this planet already has the values they need to care about a changing climate. They just haven't connected the dots. And the most important thing that each one of us can do about climate change is Talk about it. If you ask people across the US, do you ever have a conversation about climate change, two thirds of people say, never. So if we never talk about it, why would we care about it? If we don't care about it, why would we vote about it? If we don't vote about it, why would we ever fix it? It all begins with a conversation today. But that conversation has to begin with what we have what we share most in common. Too often we tend to begin conversations on what divides us the most. Uncle Joe, how can you say that? You know that's not true. But if we begin a conversation instead from a place of respect, focusing first of all on what unites us, what we truly agree on, what we share, from there, we can walk together, connecting the dots to why the exact person I already am is the perfect person to care about a changing climate. If you don't know where that place is, then don't have a conversation about climate change yet. Have a conversation and get to know them. What makes them tick? What do they love? What are their passions? What are their fears and their concerns? And then when you find something, that's when the conversation can begin. So I feel that the greatest lesson that I have learned in my entire career of having thousands of conversations with people all across the US and beyond is the very first lesson that I learned from my husband. And that is that we already have the values we need to care. And by recognizing that in each other and by respecting who each other is, we can have the types of constructive conversations that we need to help us all move forward together. Because in reality, don't we really want the same things when it comes down to it? Don't we really want a better world, not a worse one? Don't we really want energy that's abundant for everyone, an economy that's healthy, resources that are available to the rich and the poor? Clean air to breathe, clean water to drink, enough food to eat, a safe and happy and healthy planet to live on? That's what we all want. I was speaking to the Royal Astronomer of England last year, and Stephen Hawking had, had just said before he died that, you know, maybe we'll have to terraform Mars so we can move there to escape from climate change. So I talked to Martin Rees, and Martin Rees said, oh, I've known Stephen for a long time. I said, well, what do you think of, of the idea that we should terraform Mars to escape climate change? And he said something I've never forgotten. He said, fixing climate change is a dawdle in the park compared to terraforming Mars. <laughs> this is the only home we have, and we share it with every single brother and sister on this planet. 
What's the best thing we can do for ourselves, for our families, for every single one of us? The best thing we can do is have that conversation today. Thank you.